were fast, they were sleek. They smashed all existing speed records and set the pace for a new railway age. A unique blend of Victorian steam technology and space age styling, the streamlined locomotives that raced from London to Scotland in the late 1930s captured the hearts and minds of the traveling public. For a few extraordinary years, the lines to Scotland carried the fastest trains in the world, as two companies vied for the prestige of holding the speed record. This is the story of that brief and thrilling episode in railway history, the golden age of the streamliners. Britain's railways are changing, and history is repeating itself. Two companies, Virgin Trains on the west coast and GNER on the east, are battling it out in the race for passengers on the same tracks that once saw the epic contest between the streamliners of the steam age. In the 1930s, they had style, didn't they? And both the LNER and the LMS had styling competitions. They were going to be the fastest, uh, they were going to set records, uh, staff did walk taller as a result. So there's a touch of romance there, there's a touch of heritage, a touch of history, which, uh, which I think uh, appeals uh, to everybody, but particularly the British. I think the British are very, <laughs> love their railway system. The railway age was born out of Britain's industrial revolution. A lot of heavy goods had to be shifted and the railway was invented to do just that. Passenger trains came later and began running to regular timetables. The railway introduced a new concept to a horse-drawn world, speed. The impact of speed was quite remarkable. The railway, through its timetable and through its very nature of operation, uh, made people aware of minutes for the first time. The railway produced timetables which said that a train would leave at 10.17 and would arrive at 11.23. And that imposed expectations and disciplines and requirements on not only themselves, or the way they operated the trains, but also on their passengers. They bring a whole new understanding of what time meant, and of course they've helped businessmen understand that time is money. In the 1930s, the railways in the north of Britain were owned by two giant companies. The LMS, or London, Midland and Scottish, ruled on the west coast, while the east coast was LNER territory, the London Northeastern Railway. Both ran between London and Scotland, and both claimed to be the finest railway in the world. Since they couldn't both be right, each had to prove the point by upstaging its rival at every possible opportunity. It's LMS versus LNER, and certainly in the 1930s, there is absolutely no doubt it was intense rivalry. Anything the other one could do to pull a fast one uh, and have one over the other side was done, without any doubt at all. Your railway system was always better than the other. So obviously it was a BME bonnet that I was an LMS man. And of course, the only other one that existed, as far as we were concerned, was the London North Eastern. It was the railway, it was the LNAR, London North Eastern Railway Company. To me, that, you know, you, you were always proud of the company you worked for. We used to get North Eastern men coming into Liverpool, York men particularly, used to come in and they'd be talking about our A6s are better than yours and this, that and the other. But a North Eastern man was taught to think for himself, you see, and that's what they didn't like. But having said that, Whenever there was any foreman's vexes and that, on, on L and yeah, I got the middle of them, I was putting in for them. They knew the best company was to work for. They ran on separate routes to different destinations, and the rivalry was more about prestige than territory, but it was good for business. It was in everyone's interest in the individual companies to fly their flag, to be the best, the fastest, the biggest, the most powerful, the best service, the most famous train. 
it all developed into the rivalry between the two companies. And this has never gone away. It's still there today. The flagship of the LMS on the west coast was the Royal Scot. The 10 a.m. express from London Euston to Glasgow. Its arch rival was the Flying Scotsman. The LNER Express, which also left London at 10 a.m. from King's Cross and ran up the east coast to Edinburgh. But the Flying Scotsman sounded a lot faster than it actually was. Since the mid-19th century, the railways had enjoyed a virtual monopoly on long-distance travel and the LMS and LNER had a long-standing, cosy agreement not to compete for speed on the run to Scotland. Trains took a leisurely eight and a quarter hours to cover 400 miles, and the companies saw no need to speed up their services. But by the 1930s, the world had moved on, even if the railways hadn't. Now road travel, lorries, buses, and increasing use of the private car began to threaten the railways. Something needs to be done. The railways need to sharpen up their act. They need to be able to say to a public that's becoming more and more used to the idea of travelling by other forms of transport that the railways have something to offer, that the railways should still be at the heart of the country's transport network. The LMS and the LNER realized that it was high time they improved their act. In 1932, their agreement not to go for record speeds was scrapped, and the stage was set for an epic duel between these two giants. The race to the north was on. The LNER set out to project an image of speed with a series of publicity films. A bizarre three-way contest between a light aircraft, a speedboat, and the LNER appeared to show that rail travel was as fast as flying, and going by boat wasn't. I am speaking to you from the Flying Scotsman. Another modern marvel, radio, was demonstrated, proving that a train could talk to a plane even if there was nothing much to say. Hello, G5FL, ex-Canada calling and hearing you perfectly. We had no difficulty identifying you from above. Expect to reach Glasgow via Edinburgh at 4 o'clock. Over! But the LNER's greatest asset was its locomotive designer, Sir Nigel Gresley. He had created a fleet of powerful and fast express locomotives to haul the long-distance trains. Gresley has this eye for the thing looking right, and wherever you go with Gresley's coaches, with the locomotives, you can't get away from the fact that there is a form there, a form and function in harmony. Over on the west coast, the LMS was well behind its LNER rival. Most of its locomotives were outdated machines and too small to haul heavy trains. Even the best of its passenger engines were no match for Gresley's designs on the East Coast. The London Midland needed a new broom to sweep away the old regime. In 1932, they found him. William Stanier was persuaded to leave the Great Western Railway and join the LMS. Stanier's brief when he came from the Great Western in the early 30s into a, a railway where they had small engines, inadequate engines, was to bring the engineering up to a competent standard. So he had big, big problems to deal with, and listening to people saying, we haven't got anything to run our trains with. Stania wasted no time in stamping his authority on the LMS. Soon, the obsolete locomotives began heading for the scrapyard as new and far better Stania designs replaced them. 
the London Midlands Scottish was shaping up for a showdown with its arch rival. In the 1930s, all Britain's railways relied on the same basic tool, the steam locomotive. It was a machine which had barely changed since 1830. Locomotives got bigger and heavier, but the formula stayed the same. Basic, absolutely basic. It's uh, warming water to create steam to move the thing along. And uh, it's as basic as that. The same force which lifts the lid of the kettle can produce almost unlimited power, which the locomotive designers learned to harness. It was simple, but it worked. More modern designs of diesel and electric locomotives were not yet able to mount a serious challenge to steam on heavy, long-distance runs. But steam supremacy was beginning to be challenged overseas. In Germany, Adolf Hitler's Nazi regime was determined to promote German technology to the world. The cities of Hamburg and Berlin were linked by a lightweight diesel rail car known as the Flying Hamburger, running at up to 100 miles per hour. The London North Eastern Railway's chief designer, Nigel Gresley, visited Germany and sampled the ride. And Gresley took the view that although the diesel multiple unit might provide useful service in some circumstances, he was convinced that the slightly more conventional steam train with more facilities on board and hauled by a steam locomotive could do the job at least as well. Steam engines might look old-fashioned, but they were robust and reliable. They were also just as fast as the diesel. In 1934, Gresley's Flying Scotsman locomotive set a new British speed record of exactly 100 miles per hour. He firmly believed that steam was still the future, but saw that it had a growing image problem. Other forms of transport were discovering a new look, streamlining. In the air and on the roads, rounded, flowing shapes were replacing sharp angles. Suddenly, everything had to be aerodynamic to look modern. Streamlining was the, all the rage and everything had to be streamlined and if you weren't streamlined, you weren't with it. Gresley decided to create an entirely new train for the LNER in the latest fashion. What Gresley had to do was to take the conventional steam locomotive and to encase it in something that would really wow people into thinking this is space age travel. And the Silver Jubilee train with not just the locomotive sleek and streamlined, but the whole train looked like something out of the space age. After only six months, Gresley and his team had finished the job. And the new train was launched on September the 27th, 1935. It was called the Silver Jubilee. On the 110th anniversary of the opening of the first English railway, the Silver Jubilee, drawn by the streamlined Silver Link, left King's Cross. She is to run regularly between London and Newcastle. Speed, comfort, and a wild modern beauty. It certainly looked the part, streamlined and stylish. But under the aerodynamic casing was a conventional steam locomotive designed to run at high speed. On its first run, the streamliner soon got into its stride, breaking the 100 miles per hour barrier south of Hitchin. As the mileposts flashed past, the speed never dropped, and even the most hardened news reporters on board were open-mouthed. For over 43 miles, the train averaged more than 100 miles per hour and twice touched 112, a world record 
for steam. The LNER felt that there was only one way to launch such a revolutionary train, and that was with a big bang and with the press on board. Here was this new locomotive, barely run in, securing a new record of 112 and a half miles an hour, and putting itself in the record books as the new way to go. It was a very courageous thing to do, but it worked. The new train captured the imagination of everyone who saw it fly past. It was the Concorde of its day. Uh, it caught the imagination. People would stand and, uh, on station platforms just to watch these trains go past. The star of the show is the new Pacific engine, of the type which draws the Silver Jubilee Expresses. School children are there in force to pay homage to sleek speed and silver streamlining. A streamlined train, all painted silver, hauled by a silver painted locomotive that in itself was streamlined. I mean, that really was absolutely breathtaking. I can remember it also well, seeing it streaking along this wonderful silver streak. It was exactly what it looked like, perfectly lovely, especially if there was a bit of evening sunshine. You'd get a, a distant view of the train coming along, and that's when, if it were perhaps a streamliner, the cry would then go up, streak, you see, and everybody gets right really excited. And then nine times out of ten, of course, the driver would whistle. It was absolutely incredible to see. It was extraordinary. Very, very impressive. But the operational problems of running a high-speed service were enormous. In the 1930s, the railway was a crowded and busy place. There were slow-stopping trains that called at every wayside station. Most freight still went by rail, carried by a fleet of one and a half million goods wagons. As they clanked and rattled along at 30 miles per hour, they clogged up the system in all directions. But freight was the railway's biggest earner, and the wheels of industry had to be kept turning. And all these movements had to be protected by a forest of mechanical signals. To give you an idea, from York to London and back, there was 800 and odd signals you had to learn. You had to know who controlled every signal, every signal box, every pair of points and shunts, where they could put you inside, where they could run you around your train. You had to know all that. The Silver Jubilee needed a lot of track to stop safely, and clearing a path for the high-speed service was a signalman's nightmare. Nothing was allowed to get in the way of the LNER's flagship service. The Silver Jubilee I did travel on, but I gather if you were a North London commuter, you were not at all amused by the Silver Jubilee. Invariably, you'd get stuck in a loop line waiting for the darn thing to go roaring past. Everybody's sitting there in great comfort, having a drink or whatever it might be. And I don't think it went down at all well with the locals in North London. But anybody living up in the north of England, of course, it's absolutely marvellous service. They had very good catering facilities on them. This means a kitchen car, and this will mean a chef in proper kit. We're not talking paper cups here, but a proper chef with a white hat on. So when you're going along on this superb train doing your 90 miles an hour and you're actually eating a very fine, well-cooked roast milk, and the whole thing is quality, from the streamlining to the speed to the food to the service, the waiter, properly dressed, delivered flunky, properly done, high standards. The slow goods trains were often stuck in loop lines, waiting for the streamlined express to pass. Their crews enjoyed rather more basic catering than the Silver Jubilee's passengers, but improvisation was all part of the job. And of course, you'd be inside loops for hours. They used to might like to make a fry up, which I have done myself. It's a, a very rare person who doesn't start sniffing with anticipation at the smell of bacon or eggs frying. Uh, you've only got to mention the word and you can almost smell it <laughs> no matter where you are. 
the ability to utilize this wonderful fire uh, and make a frying pan out of the shovel, which is superbly shaped to retain the fat and be able to braise the egg yolk, as it were. It makes you feel really good, doesn't it? <laughs> and there was nothing nicer than a little bit of egg and bacon on the shovel. The Silver Jubilee was never designed to run at 100 miles per hour plus in normal service, but it regularly ran at 80 and kept to its tight schedule. The press and the public loved it, and it made a profit. The Silver Jubilee was designed specifically to benefit the Tyneside businessmen. It wasn't a matter for Londoners, it was for the businessmen in the industrial heartland as it was served by the LNER of this country, to get to London, to have a meeting, and then to get home again all in the same day. A wonderful example of concentrating on what the passenger wanted. The LNER was clearly winning the race to the north. The LMS rival realized that something had to be done, and done fast. In the 1930s, the London, Midland and Scottish Railway faced an uphill task if it was to challenge the London Northeastern speed record. Both their main lines ran between London and Scotland, but it was not a level playing field. The East Coast main line runs through miles of open country. Most of the route is flat and straight, giving the trains an easy run to Edinburgh. But the West Coast Line passes through the industrial Midlands, then twists and turns as it climbs over the Cumbrian hills at Chap Fell and Beatock in the southern uplands of Scotland, before reaching Glasgow. They were very different routes. The East Coast has always been the racetrack, very straight railway, basically level, with limited number of junctions. The West Coast is totally different. Um, it's got almost 50% more trains on the route, so it's a much more congested railway. It's got far more junctions. It's a very curving railway, unlike the East Coast, so it's an almost continuous reverse curve from London to Glasgow. So it, it is quite a miracle. You can achieve almost the same journey times on both routes. It was achieved by sheer brute force. Soon after joining the LMS, their chief designer, William Stanier, produced a new type of huge and powerful express locomotive. In 1936, number 6201, Princess Elizabeth, set out from Euston to challenge the LNER's lead in the race to the north with a 400-mile non-stop run to Glasgow. After 250 miles of hard running, the train reached the northern hills and the long haul up Shap Fell. They go racing through the Loon Gorge and now they're heading for T Bay and Shap and they're really, really going for it. It must have been fantastic atmosphere on the footplate because they know what's ahead of them. They said, this is it, this is what we're going for. I think it must have been absolutely brilliant. And then you come through T Bay on the whistle, you know, shooting through. It's sobering to just think about what's happening with a steam locomotive on these high-speed runs. The amount of coal that these guys had to shovel when the locomotive is performing up sharp, it just goes on and on, and the shoveling never stops. Because of this awesome furnace, that had to be fed. The amount of physical effort required is phenomenal. You never saw a fat fireman. They were all wiry men. They were never promoted to drivers until they were past their physical best. And for all the power of the engine, you're being worn down, you know, it's wearing you down. It's only when you climb them on the footplate of a steam locomotive, then you realize what's going on on those hills. And they bring 
even the most able steam locomotive to its knees. But Princess Elizabeth was more than a match for Shap, reaching Glasgow in just under six hours. She returned the next day even faster, maintaining an average speed of 70 miles per hour for 400 miles. It was an astonishing achievement and a personal triumph for William Stanier. The LNER now faced some serious competition. The LMS had shown what its locomotives could do, but speed was not enough. They had to look the part, and the LMS knew that meant streamlining. The engineers on the LMS really were very reticent about putting streamlining on, but uh, they did it because the LNER had done it and uh, you couldn't be left behind in that sphere. The new train would be launched in 1937, linking London and Glasgow in six and a half hours. To maintain the royal theme, it would be called the Coronation Scot, in honour of Britain's new king, George VI. But amid the celebrations, there were other headlines. Adolf Hitler was not only making the trains run on time, he was rearming. There was even talk of a possible war. Britain badly needed some good news, and the railways were determined to mark the coronation in style. The LMS began building its new streamliner. The locomotives, designed by William Stanier, were an even more powerful version of his original design. It's fairly well known that the design team were given the brief put the biggest set of wheels underneath the biggest boiler to the maximum size loading gauge you can and see what we come up with. What they came up with was Britain's most powerful express locomotive. Officially, they were the Princess Coronation class, but most railway men knew them as the Duchesses. In its gleaming blue paintwork, the first locomotive was rolled out of the crew works in May 1937 for the benefit of the newsreel cameras. Before an admiring crowd, the Coronation Scot, the LMS contribution to improved travel in Coronation year, takes her bow. As a debutante, she makes a great impression, a streamlined figure proof of what can be done if a girl wants to be faster than 70 miles an hour. And this is the Duchess. I mean, this, that's the ultimate locomotive. In my mind, there's no doubt about it. The ultimate got to be a Duchess out of Euston. Fantastic things. And her creator, Mr. Stanier, looks well pleased. In fact, Stanier regarded the streamlining as little more than a marketing gimmick. He knew it made little difference to performance. The Coronation Scott is one of five streamlined locomotives designed to draw the new air-conditioned luxury train, scheduled soon to run between London and Glasgow in six and a half hours. And that's going some. And to remind the travelling public just how far the modern railway had come, the London Midlands staged another photo opportunity for the cameras. Their oldest locomotive, built in 1838, running beside the Coronation, built in 1911, and their newest locomotive, the streamlined Coronation Scot of 1937. It all got a bit confusing, but the message was clear. The LMS was now every bit as modern and stylish as the LNER. It was something new, wasn't it? And it, it stood out. And on top of that, all the coaches were there to match. It looked lovely. But to get on one, to fire it, and eventually drive it, it's, it's nobody, nothing nicer, nothing nicer. It took your breath away. On the 29th of June, 1937, the Coronation Scot made its inaugural press run. One hundred journalists and railway officials took part in a test run from Euston to Crewe and back that provided such an orgy of speed as has never before been indulged in over LMS metals. It was an orgy they would remember for the rest of their lives. The LMS now set out to beat the speed record on the downhill run into Crewe, but they were taking a big risk. 
from 85 miles an hour, the speed rose quickly to 100. Faster yet and faster, eating up the miles. 102, 105, 108, and she's still accelerating. Crew station and a 25 miles per hour speed limit were fast approaching, but the record was still not in the bag. The rhythm of the exhaust grows stronger, faster. 112.5 miles an hour for two miles, smoothly surging over the metals. A supreme effort, and Coronation has done it. 114 miles an hour, the highest speed yet attained in the Empire. With only two miles left to run, the brakes were slammed on but the heavy train was going much too fast for safety. As the train shot into the station yard with sparks streaming from its brakes, it was still doing almost 60 miles an hour. As it hit the sharply curving track leading into the platform, the locomotive lurched wildly. It stayed on the track, but only just. The accounts of it sound dreadful when you read it and your toes curl up because clearly they'd, their enthusiasm had run away with them and they'd not appreciated that going for the record means going for record stopping distances and they nearly came to grief. And so what we saw at the time was interestingly not the near disaster. You read that the LMS got the record, the 114. The LMS had wrested the crown, if you like, from the LNER with its run of 114 miles an hour, which was a startling thing to have done. It was not a one-horse race, there's no question of that. The LNER did have competition. In six and a half hours, the Coronation Express can reach Glasgow, a steel arrow whistling its way across the land. Today, mankind thrives on speed. But the near disaster at Crewe had demonstrated the dangers of record breaking and the rival companies declared an uneasy truce. Speed records grabbed the headlines and filled the trains, but one accident could ruin everything. The battle switched to providing the best service at a safer speed. The streamlined trains were a huge hit with the travelling public and the LNER added two more services to Leeds and Edinburgh, plus a new livery of two-tone blue. As the streamliners clocked up the miles, they transformed the popular view of rail travel. These futuristic flyers made it all look so easy. But the reality was still a world of grit and grime and exhausting physical labour. For underneath the glamorous exterior, they were still coal-fired steam engines, demanding very special qualities from the men who worked them. They were proud of their machine. They took a pride in their job, and it was she. There was no it. Drivers would have their own locomotive, even, and uh, they'd, if, they, if they'd have been allowed, I'm sure they'd have taken home to bed with them. <laughs> I'm fired for drivers which are big men could be rough men, but with a locomotive, they were so genteel. And of course, he'd say, come on, Mary, and he'd say, perhaps we've got there. we done it, didn't we, Mary? And he'd be talking, come on, love. These locomotives have characters. Uh, if you handle them too heavily, they won't do what you want, so they need that tender touch, as it were, from the driver. And th th these chaps who spent a lifetime on the footplate had got that. It's an immense skill. When he had spent a lifetime learning the job, memorised every rule in the book, every signal and every yard of the track, the top link driver was ready to take the streamliner to Scotland. Running the record-breaking streamlined trains of the 1930s was a round-the-clock operation. The preparations for a high-speed run to Scotland began long before the driver got the starting signal. Like the finest thoroughbreds, the streamlined icons of the steam age needed a lot of coaxing into action. 
fires need coal and the coal needs to be shoveled and the, the tender needs to be filled and the coal stockpile needs to be topped up. So it's a, a massive train of events to actually get to the point where you're ready to move the locomotive one yard, never mind 400 miles. It may have been only a machine, but the express steam locomotive wove a powerful spell on all those who entered its world. There the locomotive stands on the shed in the cold and the dark, and you've got to bring it to life. When you've got 150 tonnes plus of cold steel and cold water, it's a very cold, inert object. But you light the first match, the first piece of paper, the first oily rag, get the wood burning, gradually get a bit of coal burning, and eventually have two tons of coal burning at once. That cold, inert object is transformed into a living, moving, steaming, hissing, Machine. The person that lights the fire brings it to life. It's like waking giant up. And then the way the giant runs the race depends on how it's handled. It's a living thing. It's not just like a, a car where you turn a key and away you go. It's, it's a work of art, a work of engineering art. If you are not master of the locomotive, the locomotive will be master of you. And that's an awesome position to find yourself in. You must never be afraid of a locomotive. You, you mustn't be frightened of them. You must master that machine. You must. And that's the way to look at it. It was a thrill. It was a thrill. And at the end of the day when you'd done it, it was an achievement. I'd been that little fella controlling terrific power terrific power and doing a good job of it. And it was awesome. The steam engine is fire. In fact, the steam engine is earth, air, fire and water. It's elemental. whole thing's on the move. It's a quite terrifying thing in a way because the machine is flexing and you can feel it flexing under your feet. You've got 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit in that firebox and the only reason why the firebox doesn't melt is because there's water on the other side sucking the heat through. Nothing more exciting than being on a steam locomotive at speed. Awesome, absolutely awesome. Unlimited power, but absolutely unlimited. The thought of doing 100 miles an hour on one of these just puts the hairs up on your neck. It's excitement beyond belief. driver was somebody who everybody looked up to because they knew it was a lifetime's work to get on the principal express of the day. It was equivalent to being a Concorde pilot today. 
they knew they were good at what they did. And this is going to make you feel good inside, isn't it? I'm a skillful man, you know. And of course, if everything's going all right, there's nothing nicer. Because on my job, whether it be hail, rain, frost or snow, it's been beautiful. You were there, and even Mother Nature was looking on and saying, well, they're not doing so bad, those two lads today, are they? She's going all right. Most of the passengers knew nothing of the heroic battle taking place on the locomotive. They weren't meant to. All they needed to know was that their journey was comfortable and fast, a lot faster and a lot more comfortable than going by road. A streamlined express train was clearly the only way to travel. It was a triumph of marketing, a long train journey behind a machine born out of the Victorian age of steam, smoke and smuts had been magically transformed into a glamorous and thoroughly modern experience. But the old rivalry was still simmering away. On the LNER, Nigel Gresley was building up a head of steam for the next move in the speed contest. Gresley couldn't let the LMS keep the record of 114. It was a matter of corporate pride. And uh, Gresley asked one of his staff, do you think we could run faster than the LMS? Um, and that was clearly seen as an instruction. <laughs> There's no option about it at all. On the 3rd of July, 1938, the streamliner Mallard was booked to carry out a high-speed brake test on the East Coast Main Line. Engineers were on board the train to record her performance. They picked Mallard because it was five months old, five years old and it would have been slack and worn, five days old and it would have been tight, five months old, it's just at its best. As driver Duddington gave Mallard her head, the speed rose steadily past the magic 100 miles per hour figure. All on board realized that this was going to be something special. As the train bucked and swayed, the speed recorder crept past the record 114 miles an hour mark. Now Mallard was into uncharted territory. But she was not finished yet. Going flat out, she reached 120, two miles a minute. And for one brief moment, the speed touched 126 miles per hour. A new world record for steam locomotion. It was steam's finest hour. It was about prestige. It was about trying to make people feel good about the country, about the railway. And it was done with great panache. The LNER were out in front once more. It was time for the LMS to fight back with yet another publicity stunt. Coronation Scott is the pride of Britain's railways. So today, a hundred tons of the finest work of British engineers is en route for a 3,000-mile tour of the US before going on show at the New York World Fair. So here's good luck to the Coronation Scott. Off to show them what we can do in the way of modern transport. But in America, the Coronation Scott met the future, and the future was diesel. The British train was much admired, but even the most aerodynamic streamlining couldn't hide the truth. It was a steam locomotive, and in America, steam was fast becoming history. But all thoughts of modernizing Britain's railway system came to an abrupt halt on the 3rd of September 1939, as the railways went to war. Competition and progress were replaced by austerity and unity as the LMS and the LNER joined forces to help defeat Hitler. One of the first casualties 
was luxury travel. The special coaches were put into store and the streamliners now had to haul whatever was required to help win the war. Streamlined casing was stripped off. Image didn't matter anymore and removing it made life easier for the fitters. When victory finally came after six long years, everything changed. The rundown railway system was nationalized and steam was replaced by diesel and electric trains. Road traffic increased while the railways declined. Today's basic railway is a shadow of the pre-war network and the luxury streamliners of the 1930s are a distant memory. But the routes they travelled on still carry some of Britain's fastest trains and privatisation has reawoken old rivalries. On the east coast, GNER evoked the spirit of the 1930s, keeping alive the name of the Flying Scotsman. The Flying Scotsman did evoke the idea of great speed. Although we have one service a day which actually does uh, Edinburgh, London in three hours and 59 minutes. And when the old Flying Scotsman was running, you were talking more like six and a half hours. On the west coast, Virgin promotes a futuristic image with the Pendolino tilting train. Virgin wants to be associated with being modern, fast, different. I think the Pendolino captures that beautifully. It, it, it does look a sleek Concorde on the railway. Um, the, the service on, on the train is different. It's, it's younger people, it's a faster service. Uh, the style is different. And uh, let's enjoy the difference. Although Mallard's record was never broken by a steam locomotive, the modern streamlined trains do it on a daily basis. But nothing can quite recapture the romance of the steam age when Britain's streamliners ruled the rails and led the world. <laughs>